we're going to be discussing UK uh, counterterrorism agenda, safeguarding as a routine punishment and collective uh, self police Thanks for the opportunity. My talk here comes from many discussions over many years within the campaign against criminalizing communities. It was set up in 2000 to oppose the Terrorism Act 2000 and has continued to oppose each successive piece of so-called anti-terror legislation. Despite the growing opposition to the PREVENT program, its surveillance and punishment measures are being expanded. After reviewing the program last summer, the Home Office concluded that it should be strengthened to safeguard vulnerable individuals. Why? What drives this agenda? This question has remained marginal in the debate for and against the program. For example, the Shadow Home Secretary, Diane Abbott, recently criticized the PREVENT program as follows. Quote, the whole scheme is simply unworkable. Well, if only it were so. Unfortunately not. By unworkable, such critics mean unfair. For example, by making families fear that their children will be taken away, by frightening the children, by targeting entire Muslim communities, undermining potential cooperation against terrorism, and therefore undermining that supposed aim of the program. Amongst the many individuals who have been reported to the channel program, or potentially for that program, as holding suspected extremist views, 80% have had no follow-up action by the police. What does this mean? Well, according to critics, it means there's been a five-fold over-reporting by institutions or their staff members. In response to that criticism, the problem is inverted into a solution and a reassurance by the Home Office. Namely, those statistics indicate that the system screens out those who are wrongly identified. And so the system works well, according to the Home Office. What gets lost in such arguments is the enormous damage done, which should be called pervasive child abuse, and the creation of distrust of and amongst professional staff. Regardless of whether anyone is rightly identified, why are so many, quote, wrongly identified? Namely, because the prevent program creates fear among professional staff, especially amongst their managers, who expect a regular flow of reporting and referrals. These practices become a bureaucratic performance indicator, necessary to demonstrate that an institution is truly implementing the program, and so supposedly safeguarding those vulnerable to extremist influence. Potentially everyone becomes the police, or policed, or both. The program's entire operation depends upon a collective self-policing through fear of punishment of many kinds. For example, that inadequate compliance may jeopardize professional careers or may jeopardize an institution's standing with funders, especially through Ofsted inspections. Based on a vague definition of extremism, the reporting practices draw on and reinforce Islamophobic stereotypes. And the entire procedure generates a mass fear that individuals may be reported for anything they say, that students may be disciplined for refusing so-called de-radicalization programs, that people may be stigmatized for life, and so on. Such punishment has close linkages with the entire counter-terror agenda. A decade ago, the prevent program was established within the wider contest program supposedly to protect national security. Implicitly, targeting threats to the state from political opposition. From the start, contest explicitly linked three crucial aspects. Mass surveillance to identify an ambiguous extremism which warrants various preventive and punitive measures. In 2009, 
This linkage was explained by the Home Office Chief of Counterterrorism, Charles Farr. Namely, the government has targeted a large group of non-violent people who create an environment in which terrorists can operate. On this rationale, so-called non-violent extremism necessitated a broad range of, of executive powers. For example, to power to withdraw passports, to impose travel bans, even to revoke citizenship, which has been done to several dozen people, in some cases a precursor for drone assassination of people who are no longer UK citizens. With all its ambiguity, this phrase, nonviolent extremism, better describes the target of all anti-terror legislation since the Terrorism Act 2000, or arguably even the 74 Prevention of Terrorism Act, which was aimed at terrorizing Irish people. Given that violent acts and threats were anyway illegal under the ordinary criminal law or under the very broad conspiracy laws in this country, these new anti-terror laws stigmatized and even criminalized non-violent ones, authorizing punishments without trial or even without evidence. Punishments include longer detention without trial, harassment for displaying suspect symbols, long detentions at courts under Schedule 7, and so on. Under its own statutory duty, the Charity Commission likewise has been imposing punishments, disqualifying individuals from serving as a charity officer, suspending an organization's activities during long investigations, in some cases three times, in turn making those organizations vulnerable to banks denying or terminating bank accounts. On top of all these powers which have already been used, there is worse to come. In May 2015, the government announced plans for a counter-extremism and safeguarding bill, note that key term, which would strengthen executive powers to punish any extremist behaviors or even extremist views in the name of protecting, <coughs> safeguarding vulnerable individuals. The proposal had three new types of civil orders, that is, through executive powers. Banning orders to ban extremist groups, extremism disruption orders to stop individuals engaging in extremist behavior, and closure orders, it's closed down premises, which are used to support extremism. Any breach of those orders would be a criminal offense. Thus, the Crown Prosecution Service would not need to present evidence to the requisite standard for criminal trial under the ordinary law, they would only need evidence that someone had contravened this executive order. The draft bill also proposed more executive measures, an extremism trigger, which would guarantee that complaints about extremism are fully reviewed by the police and local authorities. The Disclosure and Barring Service, EDS, would be expanded so that employers identify extremists and stop them from working with vulnerable groups. The DDS would notify employers of any new information about extremism relevant to an employee, especially to bar anyone who had a criminal conviction or even just a civil order for extremist activity. All these punishment procedures lack due process or even testable evidence thus extending similar measures from all anti-terror legislation since the Terrorism Act 2000. In practice, suspect extremists are already treated as suspect terrorists. Likewise, potential crime is treated as if it already were a crime. In the updated contest strategy, moreover, the government will counter online extremist ideology by monitoring websites and removing propaganda. We will set up alternative platforms to challenge extremism by using a network of commentators to maintain appropriate content. <laughs> there will be intervention across all institutions to eliminate extremism along the same lines as the prevent strategy. All these measures intensify the close linkage I mentioned before, namely between an ambiguously defined extremism, mass surveillance, and executive powers of punishment without due process. Potentially everyone, even taxi drivers, I believe, everyone is drawn into monitoring and policing each other. 
for example, by avoiding any discussion or events that might trigger suspicion. Looking back a decade, when Prime Minister Tony Blair was announcing new counter-terror legislation, an MP shouted out in the chamber, at least state, and she shouted back at the heckler, just telling us what the sentence said, a more accurate description would be collective self-policing to impose routine punishment or to avoid such punishment thus undermining mutual trust and our democratic rights. Is this kind of damage an incidental byproduct? No, it is integral to the political agenda. Indeed, this explains why the prevent program will be strengthened and perhaps even complemented by more punishment powers, thus intensifying the fear regime. These practices create their own logic, their own database, their own evidence of proto-extremist threats, their own reality, thereby reinforcing the need to expand the program. This has analogies with the early debate on the war on terror. When journalists question whether the Bush regime was always targeting real threats of terrorism, his chief, Karl Rove, responded you are living in a reality-based world. We create our own reality. The counter-terror strategy, or counter-extremism strategy, also has analogies with a wider shift in the entire neoliberal project towards routine punishment of vulnerable groups, or even of entire countries. When the Troika imposed heavy conditions on Greece, to cover its debt, which means to reimburse its creditors, not to benefit anyone living in Greece, supposedly to bring economic recovery, the finance minister denounced the Troika's demands as fiscal waterboarding, thus making explicit the link with the so-called war on terror. Another example, during this country's condemned coalition starting in 2010, austerity measures likewise were imposed in the name of bringing prosperity to all. Benefit sanctions were expanded to tens of thousands of people, officially to encourage their return to work. Yet, of course, the sanctions often undermine any weak prospects that such people had. Across all these examples, state representatives lack the will or the capacity to justify how the punitive measures are supposedly warranted by some behavior or misbehavior, and likewise lack the capacity to justify how they supposedly bring benefits to anyone, except perhaps bankers. As William Davies has argued in a recent article in the New Left Review, these punitive measures have, quote, a relentless form that acts in place of reasoned discourse thus replacing the need for any hegemonic consensus. Empty affirmations of good intentions are repeated ritualistically. Quote, power now seeks to circumvent the public sphere in order to avoid the constraints of critical reason. Why this somewhat new form of neoliberalism? Well, of course, the state always declares different aims than its real agenda, namely, punishing people or countries into submission, which cannot be explicitly acknowledged or justified. The counter-extremism agenda conveniently undermines democratic rights, suppresses popular debate about UK foreign policy, and diverts blame for everyone's problems elsewhere away from state policies. For truly preventing terrorism in the traditional and the conventional sense of the word, and for truly safeguarding individuals, many critics have asked for alternative means. Of course, such means or such alternatives have been attempted by many Muslim groups and other groups, but their efforts are being sabotaged by the state's counter-extremism agenda. To develop a counter-strategy, 
we should emphasize the following analysis that an ambiguously defined extremism serves the state's anti-democratic agenda of collective self-policing, mass surveillance, routine punishment, and fear of such punishment. All this complements a wider regime of neoliberalism lacking any defensible linkage between the punishments and individuals' actions, or much less benefits. In the prevent program, the routine punishment will intensify until professional staff build greater self-confidence to defy the fear, to refuse their police role, to challenge its xenophobic assumptions, and thus to make the program truly unworkable. Such revolt has begun even before the prevent program was made statutory, but this revolt needs safeguarding. So how can we help to build the safeguarding of the revolt and the solidarity? 